Good morning. This is session two of the sacraments, and um, this comes to you from Haskell Hall in the Episcopal Church of the Redeemer on Tech Drive in Ruston, Louisiana in the United States. And you can learn more about our parish by going to www.rustonredeemer.org. And we urge you to subscribe to this YouTube channel and also to like it, if you would please. Um, this is our schedule. Um, last week was May 5th, and we talked about creation and the fact that God really loves us. And the important part of creation for this class is that God created not only us human beings, God also created the material world. And the material world is therefore, since it is a part of God's creation, the material world is not evil. And according to God, in the first creation story, after God created all of the things on the six days of creation, he said, it is good. He saw it and he saw Kitov, that it, it is good. And then on the sixth day of creation, when he created um, man and woman in God's own image, he looked at that together with everything else in creation and said, it is tov ma'od, it is very good. So the world being good is an extremely important thing for our sacramental theology, because if the world is evil, then it would stand to reason that God is not going to try to reach out to us through the things in the material world, right? So we like the idea that, that the material world is good. You'll remember that in the Book of Common Prayer of this church, it says, the sacraments are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace. And then they are given by Christ. And that's the reason we only have two sacraments that are sacraments, because only those two were instituted by Christ. The other five were instituted in the life of the church after the risen Christ uh, was, and the Holy Spirit was given to the church, but only two were instituted per se by Christ. Uh, and so in the 39 articles, it was a kind of a Reformation thing. We believe that there are two sacraments. But the important thing is not the number of the sacraments. The important thing is that they are outward and visible signs, yes, but very important they are not only signs of grace, they are means by which we receive that grace. And so in the Book of Common Prayer, we refer to the sacraments as means of grace. Lutherans also use the term means of grace to refer to baptism in the Eucharist. Um, and so the grace is the important thing. Um, if you were to, we're very familiar with the, God, the resurrection stories in Mark 16, 1 through 8. And then if you read the resurrection stories in John, one of the things that happens is that when the risen Christ um, appears to the disciples in John, as he does not do in Mark, but in John and in Matthew and Luke, but especially John here, the risen Christ appears to the disciples and he breathes on them Remember, God, <coughs> God breathed on Adam in the, in, um, at the, in the second creation story. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living nephesh, right? And so the risen Christ breathes on the disciples that he's appearing to, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so that's very, very, very important for our theology because we believe that the risen Christ, as well as God the Father, but the risen Christ has sent and given the Holy Spirit to the church. And given the fact that we as a church have the Holy Spirit, that gives the church authority to do a whole bunch of things. It gives us authority to put together a theology. It gives us authority to regulate who receives the sacraments. It gives us the authority to put together the whole system of who gets ordained and what ordained people can do and cannot do in the church. In other words, the church has been given the authority and the necessity, of course, but especially the authority to make 
binding decisions for the church. And so that's part of what it means when in the Gospel of John it says, the sins that you, whatever you bind, whatever you forbid is forbidden, and whatever you allow is allowed. And so that gift of the Holy Spirit to the church gives the church the authority to make decisions, all the decisions about the sacraments, including how they are to be celebrated and who can receive them and who can celebrate the sacraments. If you were to read Mark 1, 9 through 11, you would read a very three-verse narrative of the of the uh, baptism of Jesus. And at the baptism of Jesus, um, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, but boom, something happens. The Holy Spirit comes out upon Jesus. It's like water being poured on Jesus. The Holy Spirit is poured upon Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, uh, whatever that means. And uh, God the Father recognizes Jesus as his son. You are my beloved. He, in this gospel alone, uh, God the Father addresses Jesus in the second person singular. You are my son, the beloved. Right? In you I am well pleased. So that's really important. In other words, we are baptized because we're following Jesus' example. And the next thing that I hope that you have read or will read is the first 11, are the first 11 verses of Romans 6. And in Romans 6, St. Paul is trying to bind disparate congregations in Rome together. See, they're apparently controversial and competitive with each other. And most of them are Gentile congregations, and one or more may be Jewish congregations of Jesus believers. See, he's trying to bind them all together. And one of the things that he does in Romans 6 is says, hey, we've all been baptized, see? And what happens at baptism? Well, according to Romans 6, we were co-buried with Christ. We were buried together with Christ in baptism. And so um, we were baptized into death because when Jesus was died, he was taken off the cross and he was buried, right? And so we... the baptisms were done outdoors in those days and so um, people went down into the water and then importantly they came up out of the water and so St. Paul compares baptism to the death you know going down is the death and then coming up out of the water symbolizes the resurrection of Christ and so what he does is that St. Paul is the earliest Christian writer, and St. Paul is the earliest Christian writer and thinker to link baptism to the death and resurrection of Christ. We don't have any evidence that anyone did it before Paul. And so he, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, he says, I delivered to you as a first importance what was also delivered to me. In other words, it was pre-Pauline, right? That makes it as old as anything in the New Testament. And the first thing he said was that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and then that he was buried and then that he was raised on the third day. And so the death and resurrection of Christ is the bedrock of Christian teaching. It's also the center of Paul's theology, by the way. And so in Romans 6, the death of Christ is associated with our sin. His burial is symbolized by our being covered with water. And the resurrection of Christ is associated, you know, you come up out of the water. The resurrection of Christ is associated with our walk in newness of life. And this assumes that baptisms in Paul's time, since there were no church buildings, baptisms in St. Paul's time were held outdoors in a body of living water. Living water means running water. See, not, they didn't have plumbing, right? So living water was running water, in other words, water that was outdoors. And then later, in a book, not in the New Testament, but just as old as part of the New Testament, there is a book called The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, the Didache of the Twelve Apostles. By the way, didasco is to teach, and didache is that which is taught, see? Um, and a didaskalos is a teacher. Um, 
And it says, now concerning baptism, baptize as follows. After you have reviewed all these things, all the things in the beginning part of Didache about the gospel and Jesus and everything, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. But if you have no living water, then baptize in some other water. And if you are not able to baptize in cold water, then do so in warm. But if you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we do. We pour water on the head. We don't sprinkle, we pour. We pour water on the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so this document, the Didache of the Twelve Apostles, is one of the earliest documents in the Apostolic Fathers. And the Apostolic Fathers is the earliest body of Christian writings after the New Testament, see? And you cannot date Didache with any precision because it doesn't have any local references, see? But the best guess would be that it's from about the 60s of the Common Era to perhaps as late as 110 of the Common Era. And that would make it just as old as the later documents. I mean, if it was 110, that would make it just as old as the Gospel of John or Colossians or Ephesians or the Pastoral Epistles or maybe Second Thessalonians. And so that means it's very old. And you don't know that it's 110. It could be 60. So it's a summary of the doctrine not attributed to Paul or to Peter or to John, but it was the Didache or the teaching of the 12 apostles. So it's very old. And so Didache chapter 7 says very plainly that living water, meaning running water or outside water, is preferable for baptism, which means that baptisms were done and bodies of water outdoors. If unheated running water was not available, like if you were 20 miles away from a body of water, any, any water would do preferably cold water. And if you don't have cold water, warm water is okay too. And baptism in the early church could be done either by immersion uh, or it could be done by affusion, namely pouring. And so that is the tradition that we follow. And unlike some Christian groups, we as Anglicans, you know, we Episcopalians are part of a group of churches, about 42 churches, that are part of the Anglican communion. And so we are Anglicans. And so as Anglicans, we believe that every person who has been baptized in the, with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, every person who has been baptized has in fact received the Holy Spirit. And we usually baptize people by pouring water on their heads, which symbolizes the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. When a person is baptized, that person becomes, in Paul's terminology from 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, Paul, Paul says that person is a member, you know, like a body part of the body of Christ. See? Um, and therefore... Remember this thing about sacraments being an outward and visible sign and there being an inward and spiritual grace, see? The outward and visible sign is water being applied to a person who has not yet been baptized, right? And it can symbolize a number of things. Baptism can symbolize, as it does in many religions, the washing away of sins. In Paul's terminology, it symbolizes death to sin. Uh, it symbolizes the outpouring of God's grace and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And how much water and how this water is to be applied to a person is not actually specified in the New Testament. Um, and by receiving baptism, you become a member of the body of Christ, which is St. Paul's definition of the church. See? And therefore, the person being baptized receives the forgiveness of sins. And the person being baptized receives, at that point, the Holy Spirit. And then, if you look in the prayer book on page 308, after, you know, after I've given them a candle that says, Receive the light of Christ, then we all say together this, We receive you into the household of God, 
confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in his eternal priesthood. The people of God all together are a holy priesthood, according to 1 Peter. See? So we confess the faith of Christ crucified. Jesus died for our sins. We proclaim his resurrection. He was resurrected. That's what the season of Easter is about. And we all share together in this relationship of God with God that we are a priestly people, namely we pray for other people who are not within the people of God, but we pray for these people and we offer spiritual sacrifices to God. So confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and notably it's not just the clergy that say this, it's everybody that's baptized says this, share with us in his eternal priesthood. That, was, that latter was new to this prayer book. Um, and so when you study religions, you know, Christianity is not the only religion. When you study religions, you learn that communities of people, and not just religious communities, communities of people include rites or rituals to signify that this person is now a member of that community, okay? Frequently in antiquity, there was the giving of new clothes. You know, you get to wear a uniform or something. You get a new name frequently. By the way, when we baptize people, I baptize them with their, usually their first and their middle name, but not their final name, not their last name. I baptize them in the, them with their Christian name, namely the name at baptism. You don't include the family name. And then in the ancient church, um, they were usually baptized outdoors until there were church buildings. And they were usually baptized naked. As far as I know, they were always baptized naked. Um, in, the, in the second century, that's one of the reasons that Hippolytus, who was a bishop of Rome, sort of, sort of a bishop of Rome, in his book, The Apostolic Tradition, he doesn't really like women as deacons. But he thinks it's okay to have women as deacons because they are the ones that baptize and anoint women who are naked, see? So anyway, they're baptized without clothes in the early church, and then after the baptism, they are usually given white clothing to wear. How many of you know what the other, ter what the other name for the day of Pentecost is? Whit Sunday. You know why it's called Whit Sunday? Because in England, it was too cold to baptize people outdoors naked at Easter. See? So the, maybe it was okay in South Italy, okay? But it was not okay in the British Isles. So they waited until the next major feast of the church, and they waited until the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is. 50 days after, after Passover. Um, you know, today is the seventh Sunday of Easter and next Sunday will be the day of Pentecost. And so the days of Easter are called the great 50 days. And so they waited until the day of Pentecost because they didn't want to kill people, including infants and children. They didn't want to kill them on the day of their baptism. And so after they were baptized naked in the outdoors, in the all together, then they would put the new white clothing on these people who were baptized. And that is the reason the day of Pentecost was called Whit Sunday, because of the white clothing that was given to people at baptism. Okay? So, um, infant baptism is a matter of some controversy up here in this part of Louisiana. Um, but in fact, nothing in the New Testament precludes the baptism of children or of infants. It's not commanded in the New Testament, but it is not concluded. It is not precluded. And if you read 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 16, Paul is writing to the Corinthians who have written him a very self-congratulatory letter saying that they are filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they are rich, they're like kings already. And he answers them very sarcastically in 4.8 where he says, already you are filled, already you are kings. Without us, 
you are reigning as king. Well, I wish you had become king so that we could reign along with you. How about that? 1 Corinthians 4. But in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I'm in hearing that you, some people of you, some of you say, I am of Paul. Some of you are saying, I am of Apollos. He was the other apostle that was in Corinth. Some are saying, I am of Peter. And then there are others who are saying, I am of Christ. And then he lets them have it. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Understood answer, no. I am thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. But beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. He didn't keep a parish register. Okay, but I baptized the house of Stephanus, and the house of Stephanus would normally include, um, the house of Stephanus would include the mom, the dad, any grandparents, it would include the children, including infants, and it would include the slaves. That is what is meant by the house of Stephanus. And so that is the, a very reasonable reading of 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and following. And so the other thing is, if, if you're baptized babies, you're not really washing away their sins because I don't think they've, babies have sinned just yet. Um, but it suggests that the major of emphasis of ba on baptism in the church should not really be the forgiveness of sins or quote unquote being saved, but rather the major emphasis, this major center of gravity in the rite of baptism and its theological meaning is that this person is now included in the body of Christ. And the reason why this person is included in the body of Christ is that it's because of the grace of God and the God that is giving this grace to us is a loving God, right? God does not want to send us to, to hell. Um, by the way, in this prayer book, as well as it's more explicit in this prayer book, but it was also in the other prayer books too. And in Anglican prayer books, Anglican prayer books stress the gift of the Holy Spirit upon the person who has received baptism. Quote, in the prayer over the water, which my teacher wrote, Lee Mitchell wrote that prayer. Through it, you know, first it says, we thank you, God, for the water of baptism. And it says some other things. And then it says, through it, we are reborn in the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say, um, after the baptism, there is a prayer that the priest or the bishop says, we heavenly father... And it goes on to say, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon these your servants the forgiveness of sins and have raised them to the new life of grace. Note, there's forgiveness of sins and the idea of being raised, which of course adumbrates resurrection. Sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. And it goes on from there. And so, by the way, baptism is permanent. You cannot be unbaptized. Um, there are people nowadays who are asking about that. And yeah, we can remove you from the parish register, which means I write an R, and then I say, well, this person has renounced the Christian faith. Or I, I write an R because I've transferred them to another Episcopal church. Or I write an R, and I say they've become a member of the Baptist church or whatever, and I give the date. And so then I can no longer count them as a member of the Episcopal church. Um, but baptism is permanent. Or the other way you can, do you know the other way you can l lose your membership in the church? Death. <laughs> um, death. Uh, that's a, a big one right there. Um, holy, holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit. This is the first sentence on page 298. Okay. Holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. The bond which God established in baptism is indissoluble. You never, you never quit being a beloved child of God. So the important thing is not so much who does the baptism. The important thing is that it's done with the sacramental sign of water and the sacramental sign of the words of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
which are obviously the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are obviously in the, in the Bible. Um, now, you notice that it says at the top of page 298, Holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. The bond which God established in baptism is indissoluble. And um, in the 1928 prayer book, it said that you had to be confirmed or ready and desirous to be confirmed. In other words, you've instructed them and the bishop hasn't come yet, but they're really ready to receive communion. They're ready and desirous to receive communion. They, I mean, they've been instructed by the priest, etc. The bishop hasn't been there and won't be there for another 10 months. You could communicate them, which means you could give them communion. And so that rubric, the confirmation rubric, that said you had to be confirmed or be ready and desirous to be confirmed is not to be found in this prayer book. It's gone. <laughs> it was gone. And even before they passed this prayer book, overwhelmingly in 1976 and overwhelmingly again on second reading in 1979, in 1970, General Convention in Houston said a couple of important things. One is that women who were set apart as deaconesses were within the diaconate. Boy, was that earth shaking. And the other thing they said is that people who have been, kids that have been baptized uh, and they have been so properly instructed and their parents give permission may receive communion. And that was even before the new prayer book was, was even, we, we didn't even know when it would be, see? So even before the 76-79 prayer book, see it has to pass two journal conventions, even before our current prayer book in 1970 at general convention in Houston, the general convention allowed via a resolution that children could receive communion. And there was a book written about it called Young Children in the Eucharist, written by Terry Holmes who taught at Neshota House. He later became the dean of the seminary, the School of Theology at Sewanee. So there was a great deal of thinking and rethinking in the 60s and especially in the 70s about how we administer the sacraments and especially baptism. And this prayer book, by putting this thing on page 298 at the very beginning where it says concerning the service, right, you know, the page right before the baptism service begins on 299, it's full initiation. Now, a lot of Episcopalians believe that you still had to be confirmed to, be, to receive communion, and you had to be confirmed at the magic age of 12. So in 1988, General Convention, for those who couldn't read, General Convention passed a resolution that said, full, holy, com, you can receive communion because the prayer book says full initiation, and full initiation means you can receive communion. But some people, some of the clergy who were trained back in the, in the dark ages. Um, we won't go into which seminaries those were. But anyway, some of the clergy who were trained back before the, this prayer book and were never trained in this prayer book, see, um, they still believe you had to be confirmed. And so they wouldn't let kids receive communion until they were confirmed, which was certainly um, very much against what this prayer book was about. But obviously, full initiation means that the baptized person may receive communion. And yes, you're going to ask me, does that mean a baby can receive communion? And the answer is yes. We had a little gold spoon, and we would give Holy Communion from the chalice, put it on the tongue of the baby on the day of his or her baptism. I've done it. I would do it again. I don't think we have one of those little gold spoons. It's called an intinction spoon. But if you really believe that full initiation means you're a, how can you be a member of the body of Christ and not receive the other sacraments? See? So there is a theological problem with the 1928 prayer book, one among several. And so baptism in the New Testament, of course, is the single rite of initiation into the Christian faith in the writings of the New Testament. There's no confirmation. And so one of the things that we're going to discuss next week is confirmation and the laying on of hands by apostles or whomever or bishops 
of people who have already been baptized, okay? Which they did in the West, which they didn't do in the East. They chrismate people with chrism, and that's called chrismation. And the priests in the Eastern Church do all of Christian initiation. And in the Western Church, the bishops reserved the right of confirmation to themselves. So that's a way that the Eastern Church and the Western Church are a little different from each other. But the whole point of baptizing people and confirming people is God wants them to be included in God's kingdom. God wants them to be included in the body of Christ. God wants them, God wants them to be initiated into the Christian church. The thing that has screwed us up in the Episcopal Church is that we do a great job of initiating people in the Christian faith. Baptism, and then eventually they're going to get communion and um, et cetera. Hopefully they're going to get some instruction. But unfortunately, we are not so good at saying to a kid, okay, you've been baptized, and now let's talk about what it means for you to be a Christian now, now that you're a member of the body of Christ and you've been baptized. What does God the Holy Spirit, what is God the Holy Spirit leading you to do now? See? That's called Christian formation. And that's where we really, really, really screw up. And this is the reason that I teach all these classes all the time, in case you're wondering.